Have you ever been in a place where conditions made it tough to get a signal on your cell phone or mobile device? I have a friend who came up with a solution. She scoops for signal. When her cell phone doesn't have enough reception to make a call or check the internet, she holds her phone to the sky and swings it down and back up like she's wielding a giant ice cream scoop. And the thing is, it actually seemed to work. I started doing it too, even though I know that this is not how cell phones really work. When we have a steady signal, we don't even think about it, do we? We may even take it for granted. When we don't have enough signal, we get frustrated. And I think about that with our faith. God is always sending out a signal, a signal of grace, forgiveness, love. Are we as receptive to that signal as we can be? Jesus gives us incredible life-changing sermon. It's pastoral, it's prophetic, it reaches back, it leans forward. The people are gathered in person to hear him speak and he transmits from his lips. They receive his signal through their ears. Later, someone writes it down, others curate it, still others translate it, and we receive that signal by reading it today. At the end of that sermon, Jesus says, if you hear my words and you act, it's like building a house on rock, very wise. But if you hear my words and you don't act, it's like building a house on sand, very unwise. Essentially, Jesus tells the people then and us now, ask ourselves this, whoever you are and however you experience what I have to say, are you picking up my signal? You can't really get better reception by scooping for signal with your cell phone. But I do wonder what we can do in our lives to be more open to God's signal. When Jesus says, hear my words and act on them, it's a reminder that seeking God's signal can make a difference. I wonder if God is online. In a 24-hour day, we each spend some time sleeping, eating, traveling, working, schooling, relaxing. And by some studies, for those who use the internet, they are online an average of around six hours per day. That may be for relaxing, but also for work and school all combined. That's around a quarter of the day. If someone is online for 25% of the day, does that mean they're offline from God for 25% of the day too? Or is God present online as well? Is God with someone in person and on the World Wide Web? If we know that we can feel God's presence right here, right now, can we feel God's presence also out there in cyberspace? When so much of what is online is arguments and advertising, how does God cut through the noise? And whether we're online or in real life, are we open to God's strong signal in our lives? We don't want and we don't need to live a life shut off. We can be online to God. Most people I know who access the internet do so with a mobile device, like a cell phone or a tablet. It's always a good idea to keep your battery charged, at least 30 to 80 percent. It used to not be a great idea to leave your phone plugged in overnight because it couldn't impact your device, the battery lifespan, and your electricity bill. Now, most phones let you charge overnight and it's usually considered fine for all three because of tech upgrades. Still, batteries do stop working over time. They have a limited lifespan, like us. Staying plugged in all the time, it can impact a battery's lifespan but not the way that running it down to zero over and over impacts it. When we run our device battery down to zero, it has to work that much harder to fill up the next time until the capacity lowers and lowers and just stops. We can get a new phone battery. How do we charge our faith battery? There's this parable Jesus tells us about how no one knows the hour when God arrives. This is sometimes interpreted to be about the end of the world or the end of our lifespans, and I can see that. But when Jesus says to keep awake because you don't know when God will show up, I think that can be any day. And not just when our lifespan hits zero percent. God shows up in our everyday lives. In the service project that needs people to step up. In the neighbor who needs a kind act. In the stranger who needs a kind word 
in the policy that will help people rebuild their lives that needs votes, funding, and public support, and in those moments when you need all the strength you can get to get through a transition. Maybe a few of us can stay plugged in all the time. Likely no one can stay fully charged and at full capacity all the time. And more than a few of us have been at a 0% charge sometimes. In good times and tough times, perhaps some charge is better than no charge. Keeping plugged in, however and whenever possible, can make a difference. I was a member of a website where guys who I'd never met in real life before invited me to join their weekly online video game session. And it was so much fun. They had this standing game night for years, and they welcomed me like I'd been there the entire time. They were kind, they were funny, they taught me how the game worked, and they gave me space to learn to be competent. We didn't know each other's names, and it was community. And then one of us died. We found out because one of his real life friends signed up for the website where we'd all met and told us, he said, I'm sorry, but Matt went in for emergency surgery and he passed away suddenly. I'd only played with him for a few months, but it was devastating. Some of these guys, they had played with him weekly for years and they were just crushed. His friend let us know how much he knew Matt enjoyed his time with us and thanked us for being yet another one of his communities. And then our community took it a step further. We gave each other our real names and our social media links and our phone numbers. We who had been friends weekly, anonymously, entered each other's lives in new ways, all online, spread out across the world. And when we played, we still played, but we also talked about Matt and life in general, work, marriage, family, the good stuff, the tough stuff, like a community. It takes all kinds to form the body of Christ. Paul writes that each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, a reminder that we're better together. If Paul writes of us as a figurative remembering of the body of Christ, when we are in community, do we really think the limits of the body of Christ stop at an internet connection? Our group doesn't play video games together the way we used to. Life changes. But for some of us, now our kids play together on our accounts. And the body of connections expands. God loves community in person and online. When I was a boy, my family went to see an old time medicine show that came to town. It was a lighthearted reenactment of those horse-drawn wagon touring acts of the 1800s who went town to town with music and magic and jokes and stunts and plenty of miracle elixirs. By this point in the late 20th century, the medicine show, it was just for fun. They were not trying to trick anyone into believing these miracle cure medicines were anything well medical. Yet during the show, they sold these little brown glass vials of genuine steak oil. And it became clear that they were not going to stop that part of the show until they sold enough of the stuff. So kids, myself included, ran to the stage clutching our parents' money in exchange for these little brown glass vials of genuine snake oil, which was, of course, sugar water with some vanilla extract. One of the reasons I know some people stay away from the internet is because it is filled with scammers, grifters, and con artists. These modern-day snake oil salesmen, they look for easy marks and they don't seem to care who they hurt or to what extent. It's devastating to learn about a friend who types their credit card number into a fake company website, or gave their computer password to a scammer with a phony email, or gave someone their life savings after building a relationship that turned out to be a con job. I've fallen for stuff online. It stinks. 
on the days when I want to give up on the internet because of how scammers use it, I have to remember scammers have been with us a long time. They're not just setting up fake stores online all of a sudden. They used to have a team of horses pull their wagon into town so they could stuff their pockets with greenbacks for worthless snake oil. And it was before that time, and since that time, and going forward. And scammers, there are better ways to live. In the Gospel of John, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. It's an act of devotion where he, the teacher, washes the feet of his students. And he says, I've washed your feet, you should wash each other's feet. It's this powerful statement of humility for Jesus, the teacher. It's also practical. Their feet were dirty. They walked everywhere. They wore sandals. They needed a good foot washing. What made it special was who did it. Now, I don't know anybody who can type really well with their feet, but I know a lot of us who can type well with our hands. But we don't all type 100% nice words, do we? Some of us type scams, gossip, insults, rants, threats. Maybe in our time and place of mostly closed-toed shoes instead of sandals, Jesus wouldn't need to wash our dirty feet. Maybe he'd see how we got our hands dirty and he'd wash these instead. My family knew better about that snake oil. We sometimes get a sneaking suspicion about an online scam. And as for typing scams, gossips, insults, rants, and threats, you know that there are better ways to live. May we live as if Jesus would wash our hands. It can be hard to share about your tough stuff, but wow is it brave. I pray that you have someone in your life who you can trust and share your tough stuff with them. It can also be hard to not only listen, but to know what to say. If someone tells you about the tough stuff in their life and you don't know what to say, it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm glad you told me and I'm here to listen. That can be enough. Some people share their tough stuff online. They post about their grief, pain, loss, depression, or other blindsiding blow to their lives. And when that happens, the people who love them, but they don't know what to say, they often say nothing. And they just scroll past that post. And they move on to something less emotionally challenging to read. Social media platforms use an algorithm to make money. If a someone's post has a lot of engagement, people like the post or they comment on it, it tells the algorithm, oh, users like this content, let's show them more of this so that we can put ads by it and make money. But if no one engages it, if people just scroll past it, it tells the algorithm, hmm, users do not like this content. Let's show them less of this because we can't make money off it. That person who buried their soul online only to have their friends only not only know what to say but also scroll past it, they have become even more isolated. All because the algorithm said that their depression won't make the company money. The Apostle Paul writes that those of us who are strong in the faith are to step in and help others and not just do what is most convenient. In the name of God, we're to look around and ask, how can I help? And that goes for in person and online. We may not always know the exact right thing to say when our loved ones struggle, but saying nothing can be worse than saying the wrong thing. How can we help, including online? I found the perfect gift for a loved one online. I've done some pretty fun creative projects online. I read my Bible online. I watched a documentary that changed my mind online. I prayed for somebody online. I read rumors about me online. I learned to play a new song online. I shared some of my greatest life news online. I've shared some of my greatest life tragedies online. I worship God online. I got bullied online. I got complimented online. 
I supported a small business online. I took a continuing education workshop online. I got stalked online. I enhanced old friendships online. I got laid off online. I met people from around the world online. I met my spouse on a dating website online. I watched a sermon by Archbishop Desmond Tutu that moved me to tears online. And I get to wonder about God with you online. And God was there every single time. The Apostle Paul writes, Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. The internet is part of everyday, ordinary life. And God is with us always. If we fix our attention on God, even online, where phony curation, double-edged anonymity, and simplistic mob mentality can drag us down into the depths of immaturity, God will bring out the best in us. Some people are concerned about other people spending too much time online. But I think what God is concerned about is how all people spend any of their time. Our everyday, ordinary lives can be lived in a selfish way or a generous way, a taking way or a giving way, a cynical way or a hopeful way. Ordinary life has a way of connecting us to God's way. May we hear God's signal here, online, and everywhere.